and uh, we called it Territorial, which was an amateur soldier, so in 1937 I joined, and I was then 20, and uh, very proud of myself, thinking all the girls were looking at me in my uniform. Then, um, when things got serious, the Czech crisis, so was, Germany was going to attack Czechoslovakia, and as territorial soldiers, we were going to go and help. But fortunately, nothing happened. And the next thing was we were in Norway, in Narvik, because this time Germany was going to attack, uh, rather, the Russians were going to attack the Finns. And we didn't think it was very fair. Mighty Russian, poor little Finland. So, like a bunch of idiots, off we were going to help. And then all the hells smoked <laughs> And this was in Calais, France. The reason we were there, they were trying to get that big number of troops out of Dunkirk. So it, um, it all seemed rather ludicrous, but there was a huge, about a quarter of a million British troops. They were trying to get them back to England because the situation was a calamity at that time in, in Europe. And our job in Calais was to keep the German army from coming from the west in this side, if you sort of follow. That, uh, we were expendable, that's what we didn't like. Somebody you wouldn't know, but Anthony Eden was the Foreign Secretary of Britain at the time, and I was standing by a little called wireless radio set, and I remember him saying something about you, for every hour you brave soldiers can stay, that we can get so many thousands out of Dunkirk. So we realised that we were expendable. We didn't like the sound of that. <laughs> Here, a silly little thing. Like, while we were in that citadel, uh, we could see the, the German guns were firing into the side because it was like a jelly, it was shaking. It was an old sand fort. And they were firing into the sort of side of it. The whole thing was shaking. But uh, then the dive bombers came down, the Messerschmitts. They were, uh, it's called F-88, but they had holes on the wings and when they dived down it made a screaming noise which frightened the life out of us. It was just a noise. But they came down that and off they went. They were nasty plates. But in actual fact they weren't nearly as worrisome as the gunners because they were very accurate. However, it was the two of the artillery were firing into the side making the fort shake it. It was an old sand fort and it wasn't built to be fired on. But anyway, that was, we got out of that in there and I remember jumping over the wall. We had just a transfer in Stratford on Avon and then we went up to St Andrews University in Scotland and we were the first ground course there for six weeks in which you had all kinds of lectures and so on. And we had some very fine uh, physical, phys ed training uh, that brought you instantaneous response. It was just amazing. And from there I went up to Perth and started to fly on uh, Tiger Moths. Enough pilots flew the, plane, the planes forward, the rest of us drove uh, trucks and transport forward to the next landing ground. And that's how we just moved and moved and moved. It was just amazing. They, they were preparing landing strips. On more than one occasion, they act, the engineers actually prepared a landing strip behind the German lines. It was just, just amazing. It's the first time there have been 1,000% cooperation between Air Force and ground. So it was just as though we all belonged together. Most of the time we were either escorting uh, medium bombers or just going on our own, dive bombing, and that sort of thing. After I was bringing a, a new plane up, uh, I ran into a sandstorm coming ahead. So uh, where am I going to put down? I saw what had been a landing ground on top of an escarpment. A few army trucks there, so okay. I put down, no problem. Shut the plane down. The two guys with this truck, they come, but they stop about a couple of hundred yards away. It's funny, anyhow, I walked over. Usual drill, we go to their tent, make a cup of tea and so on. 
Fortunately, it was a sandstorm that didn't last a couple of days, it just lasted a few hours. And they said, oh, by the way, <laughs> you've realised this, this landing ground's been mined. <laughs> so, <laughs> I can't see my tracks anymore because of all the sand, but I had a good idea where I'd come in, so I just turned the plane 180 degrees, took off over the escarpment over through the Mediterranean, I'm here, so everything was all right. But you didn't think anything about it, you did it. That's what we keep saying, you know, oh, you're so, it's not a matter so much of being brave as the job had to be done, so you did it. So one of my friends who trained with me, make a very good transport pilot, but not a fighter pilot, because he knew how to be safe. Like one time we were hitting an Italian uh, aerodrome and uh, you die bombing stuff, you, you're just going through small anti-aircraft, small arms fire and so on. So I said, oh well we just flip, flip round it, you see, well by the time he's done that, we're two miles away the other way. He'd been a sitting target, so he did finish up on transports because he'd be an excellent transport. The amazing thing was, as we were moving forward, uh, a couple of days later, you might be driving along where you'd actually been shooting people up. And uh, when I did go down with bearing fail in the middle of a strafing run, and eventually met up uh, with some ground, ground people, uh, one of the medics told me that he had attended the senior German panther officer whom we had actually shot up. The engine failed, the bearings in the engine, just bearing failed, the engine just, uh, oil temperature went, oil pressure went down, temperature went up, so uh, you're just in serious trouble and uh, I was lucky the engine seized and didn't blow up in my, it could have disintegrated. So what was your mission at the time when that happened? I was dive bombing a strafing German troop and equipment, Panzer Division and so on. I got out of the plane and realised I'd got this guy, so I got a first aid kit out and slapped it on. It was an American supply, so it was white bandage instead of khaki. <laughs> I scrambled off into a ditch and hid there. About three quarters of an hour later, there were three or four truck loads of uh, troops and a couple of staff cars. It turned out they were pants division that were uh, out of equipment. So they had nothing better to do than come and look for me. So I just did a wheels up landing. That was it. At the start of the war, mm -hmm. well, there were town population was, I would think, somewhere around 25,000, uh, 30,000, something like that. No, 2,500, 3,000. And uh, I was related to about half of them. <laughs> uh, I have a, a newspaper clipping from 1914 when my grandfather, my grandmother died, my great-grandmother died. and. Uh, in that clipping from the local paper that says the Lever family is the largest family collect connection in Oakville at that time. <laughs> and they had it booby trapped something fierce. It was just hard to move in there because you, you, you uh, set off a booby trap. I happened to be the uh, reserve platoon during this and uh, I'm sorry, they got held up um, in these woods, and I was told to make a left flanking around the woods and take it. Uh, there were some farm buildings around the other side of it, which we did, and we took about 20 German prisoners. We sat with the prisoners there in a building in a farmhouse one night. I had quite a chat with one of the German prisoners who spoke excellent English. He'd been to Canada. He wanted to know what uh, 
What are you doing, Gunny? He's doing over. That's not none, none of your business. You shouldn't be over here fighting us. <laughs> I had quite an argument with him during the night. <laughs> and next morning, a rather interesting story. Uh, being the Algonquins and are more or less an Indian, uh, an Indian name, and well, although we had Indians and were, but not many in our uh, unit. They decided the, the town of uh, Eschen was about a mile and a half up a road. The rest was farmland up there. They decided the Algonquin Regiment, in single file, that night, would move up one field uh, beyond the, the road. In single file, we'd move up and be in position to, to take Eschen first thing in the morning. And we did that, and uh, it was quite amusing. We ended up to, uh, and, uh, at one point, the Germans were, we could hear them talking in the farmhouse. They were laughing and talking, having a great time. And some couple of them come out to relieve themselves, and uh, they didn't know we were in the <laughs> bushes right there beside them. <laughs> uh, we took the town of Ashen that morning, and uh, it, the Germans had a lot of 88 guns sighted around the town uh, to stop our armor from, from going up. And they were uh, finally, the, our armor, we, we took the town, then our armor, the plan was they would beetle up this road, not worry about whether there were mines or anything, they were going to take a chance and join us, which they did, and there were no, the Mount Road wasn't mine. And they were loggered down behind buildings and long uh, walls and so on, and the, after we took the town, and the Germans were pounding them with 88s, and uh, the British were coming up through the fields on our right, and the colonel asked me to go up, he said, there's a tank up the uh, by the building up there, go up there and make sure he knows those are British troops, not German. So I went up, and uh, the tank commander was out of the tank, and and uh, we had a chat there. And I said, well, we were watching the British coming up. I said, don't fire on those. All of a sudden, an 88 put a round right through the middle of his tank. <laughs> so I started back down to the uh, to uh, our headquarters down the road. And there, there were three or four tanks along a wall there, and there were Germans were firing at them. And a, a piece of shrapnel flew off it and uh, went through my arm, and that's where I got, got hit. Unfortunately, uh, I, uh, I thought I'd lost my arm. And I was looking around, and there's a Red Cross jeep just coming out of the middle of the t village. And I was beetling down the road, and I held up my hand, and they saw I'd been hit. So they got me on the jeep, and uh, I going past their headquarters. I waved at the colonel. <laughs> they took me to Antwerp. I was uh, 19 uh, when uh, I have lived in. Uh, Quebec City. I had left home uh, to be on my own and uh, working in Quebec City. As soon as the uh, Japanese surrendered, yet we took our airplanes. By this time, uh, we had uh, set ourselves up in. Uh, Mingledon Airport at Rangoon. Uh, we were only there a couple of days and uh, the, the war was over. And it was a great push to get the POW. So that was, I was amazed at how fast that was laid on. Uh, you know, one day we're um, working away in Burma and next every airplane is into the air and down to Singapore and uh, flying 
over to uh, what they call Indonesia, Batavia, uh, and uh, Sumatra. We flew the uh, the POWs out. Never forget there. They were so skinny. They were just skinny rakes. Uh, Japanese had put new uniforms on them and uh, made it look good. I guess I didn't think too much of that. Yeah. So we. But they, they, they eventually called me up. They were advertising for paratroops because the paratroops came into being. In the First World War, there was a big fort on the, on the French lines, and the Germans had never been able to capture it. There was even heavier equipment than that, you know. But what happened to me one of the times, when you know that because you had all this equipment, your harness was covering over that, right? And in this instance, but it's, it must have been still slack, although I thought it was tight. It was with this, we're having all this gear and underneath. So you had, a, you had all your equipment. And you had a, a smock went over there, so there was nothing would catch on your cards when you came out when the plane, you know, when the show opened up. And uh, anyway, this time, as I went out of the plane, I went right out the harness, right? Right up to here. <laughs> um, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Talk about a shock, you know? But as I say, I managed to get back, managed to get back up. And I'm thinking, coming down, I'm holding on the, the harness, you know? But what it was, was it this equipment here, underneath this shop, this smock, they called it. Yeah. I thought it was, I thought it was tight. I thought my harness was tight, and it really wasn't. It was slack, you know? And uh, that was the only time I, I timed it, you know? That was the only time I nearly went. Because I was like, ah, they wouldn't, right? If, if I hadn't had my, my arms like this, I'd have went right with the harness, head first. Nothing to stop me, you know? Of course, and uh, my education, I finished in the Westmont High School. And then I went to work for the Montreal Star as a junior, of course. And I worked three years for the Montreal Star up until the time of my enlistment. And then when I came home from overseas, I went back to work for them for a short time. I was eight, 18, turned 19, but I was in the reserve army. I enlisted in March 1939. It was more for the glamour, I think, than anything else, because I joined the Canadian Grenadier Guards. And I was in on the second wave. I went in on an advance for the artillery to establish an area where the guns would be brought into us. And that was one of my scariest times in all the whole combat. Not so much the action, but getting off the ship and getting into a landing craft because we went down scrambling nets and the waves were six to seven feet high going up and down. And the landing craft would disappear from you and then come back up again. You had to prepare yourself to let go of your net to make sure you landed at the proper night. Not when it was coming up, but when it was starting to go down. And so we, everybody learned a few curse words because you were stepping on other people's fingers that were going down below you and or else you landed and there was a few sprained ankles as the ship was, as the landing ship was coming up. Anyways, we went ashore and, and uh, the infantry had cleared up most of what we had expected to do. And uh, we hit a sandbar going in, which was another fortunate thing for us because the water wasn't too deep when we got off. And when you, they dropped the, the face of the landing craft, all you hear is, get off the beach, get off the beach, get off the beach, because so you, you don't want to be a standing position. But fortunately, as I said, there was no resistance when we landed. Anyways, it had already been cleared up. And we made our way inland for about a mile to establish our position when the guns came in. Then the big surprise we got was that our guns wouldn't be arriving. They were at the bottom of the Mediterranean. Two ships had been torpedoed and our guns was on one of them. So that didn't affect the whole regiment because the regiment is 24 guns, but this was only the four guns and it happened to be the area that I was in. So we were dispersed in 
they transferred us over to, to make sure we got something to do. So I was more or less put on an outpost with a Bren gun. And uh, of course, when you're an outpost, it's more or less just security more than anything else because your infantry is at least half a mile or a mile ahead of you and they keep going. You know? But in 19 days, we had, we went all the way through Sicily. We'd moved through so fast that not too many things were destroyed. The things that were destroyed was the retreating German army because they set up the explosive areas and that so they to, started to slow us down. And on the 22nd of July, I was slightly wounded, but uh, it was one of the situation was, was close to an ammunition dump that had already been booby-trapped. And as we were passing by, the dump went up and actually Every wood goes up, bus come down, so the, all the debris coming down picked off a few of us. So uh, I think I was more or less hit by a, a flying rock than anything else, and just sort of get a little dent in the head. But it wasn't recorded. I was sort of they call so called a walking wounded. <laughs> but Ditley was a a fast moving operation. We just you'd you'd be in operation doing a fast attack up through Italy, and uh, then you'd come out on rest period, and then you'd do another situation. And uh, I don't know what I'm getting too far ahead of you or not, but uh, we landed in Rich Reggio de Calabria on the 3rd of September. This time I went in as reserve, not as an advance. And uh, we went up into the mountains and the, uh, the Americans and the British Army attacked further up the coast. They went in, in a place called Salerno. And the, the idea was they would go to Salerno, and we were Reggio de Calambria, and we would come up and meet. But it, it didn't happen that fast. We were a little delayed going up, and so the group at Salerno had quite a battle on our hands until the Canadians arrived up there. And then from Salerno, we moved over to the opposite coast, over to the Adriatic coast, and started moving up the Adriatic coast. And uh, one of my friends that you have the picture in, in your collection there, the picture was taken in Italy and just outside a place called Foggia, and three days later he was killed. But, uh, so altogether I had three, four friends that were killed and uh, not all with me at the time but uh, in various parts during the war. You know? Then we went up the Adriatic coast and then the next big action was Oratona, of course, was the biggest battle in Italy that we were in, and, and that would, that's where you saw, you asked about devastation. That was all, they called it at the time the, the mini Stalingrad, if you've read or anything or heard about Stalingrad. And uh, everything was flattened, and the Loyal Edmonton Regiment and the Seaforth Regiment were the big attackers in there, and uh, they developed what was known as mouse holing to move from house to house, they blasted a hole in the walls. So rather than go around fighting on the streets, they were going through from home to home to home, you know, and they called that mouse holing. And I grew up uh, in Croatia. I was born in 1920, and uh, my father came to Canada in 1926, and he brought my mother, my brother, and myself over 1929, I was nine years old at the time. Uh, in 19, uh, <clears throat> 1939, uh, they wanted me to uh, <coughs> continue uh, in Pirawawa to uh, document the personnel that are coming home from overseas. And I asked my commanding officer if uh, I did a good job for you so far, why don't you let me go? And by gosh, he did. <laughs> When the bomb was dropped, uh, uh, we, we were in, I was in wa uh, Washington, and Washington, everything stopped in Washington. The streetcars, nothing moved. There were people all over, all over Washington. Uh, nothing moved. And uh, <coughs> there was three, uh, three or four of us from Petawawa that were there, and uh, we happened to meet a uh, uh, pilot. And we asked him if uh, we could uh, have a look at Washington from from an airplane above, you know. And uh, the, the pilot says, uh, well, he says, we can't do that. It's against the law to fly over Washington. But I'm going to New York to pick up some uh, uh, big wigs. And he said, if you want to come, the three of us, if you want to come, I will, I'll take you over to New York. But uh, 
uh, you'll have to find your own way back <laughs> to camp. See? So we did go to New York and they really treat, treated us well in New York. And I really wanted to be a pilot, so I joined the Royal Air Force. I was 19 when I signed up, uh, but they, they considered me to be too, old, too young to join. I think it was 20 before they called me. It was very interesting, really, because we were sent to London, England, and into a re receiving place. And um, I think there'd been some experience with pilots who had been in training and uh, radio navigator to make sure we didn't get lost. And we flew this this brand new aircraft from Doval, Montreal, to uh, all the way to India. With stops on the way in Burma, we were right in them. We we took we actually moved into Burma to a, an airfield that had been run by the Japanese, and the army had moved them out, got rid of them, and we moved in with the with our aircraft. So they would only just left, and we got there. Well, if you remember that, you know, you're in a very bad living conditions uh, with, and, you know, you've got close friendship with all the men that are around you. And um, I was commissioned in the Air Force. I had my own servant. In, 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 even though we're in the jungle, I had a bear that used to come and make tea in the morning and take my clothes away and wash them. And my, I remember when I got home, my mother said, don't expect me to put fold your socks for you, you know. Because <laughs> they would, these Indian bearers were, they could, actually, they could actually shave a man before he woke up in the morning. They were so good at that. And, uh, but they would, um, you know, wash, take away your, your, your dirty clothes and then they'd lay them out for you in the morning and the socks were all turned down so you could put them on with a minimum of effort. <laughs> so that was uh, part of the life there. Mm -hmm. That was a little bit of luxury compared. But we had, you know, we were living on us. Our beds were two by fours, four two by fours with rope across. And that was our bed, a mattress. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we had to have a mosquito net over us. So that's the way we lived. In Burma, we were living on the ground in tents, on tarpaulin, on the ground. Well, we just we were uh, doing our operation or flying. We were, had some bombing runs to start with. Uh, we were, I think, our target was Bangkok. Was the first one. Mm -hmm. Then uh, after that, they uh, we were doing. Uh, reconnaissance flights uh, covering, we were actually taking off, we were flying 14 hours at, at the stretch and uh, this was reconnaissance over India, Burma and Indochina and it was pre to prepare for what was to be the final push to get rid of the Japanese from that whole area. Mm -hmm. So we did that for about I think six weeks or eight weeks and then one day we heard that they dropped the bomb so we thought the war might be over, but it, well, it wasn't. We were still around, you know. So our next job was to drop supplies to the prisoners of war camps in in Burma, which was a very you know good thing for us to do. And it was uh, it was quite emotional, really, because we flew. We we had a target place to find, uh, make sure you know where the Japanese camp was. And uh, then when we got there, we had to make sure we got the right place. And I remember on one occasion, um, we, uh, we weren't sure whether it was the right place. So we, somebody had a handkerchief and we put a little note in and, and a handkerchief with, a, with a, uh, some, some weight. And we dropped it over the camp and the note said, is this the camp number so-and-so? And if it is, would you line up across the runway to make sure? Well, you couldn't, you couldn't have seen those fellows move fast, quick, so quickly, you know. They lined up across the runway. <coughs> then, of course, the mistake was that now we couldn't drop the stuff because they were on the runway. So we had to drop another message to say, please clear the runway. <laughs> so that happened on one occasion. And after that, we dropped, you know, two or three drops there. And my grandfather and I used to have some time, once a year, had to grade the shoulders to level those up uh, from Drum Quinn to Postal, back up to Hornby, back down to Drum Quinn again. Anyway, uh, I was working for, I guess, but uh, anyway, and, and six group were, was a bombing group, 
and uh, if we were working with the RAF, most of it was with night flights, and every crew was responsible for doing their own thing, the timing, what they would do, and so on. You'd, you would uh, have a certain exact time to be at a certain place and drop the bombs and get out of there. While we were, uh, when we went over there, uh, we were, you got crewed up right away. And there were, there were sad times. There were times, and you'd see <coughs> the, uh, the ground crew when we were to return from operations start counting the planes, and searching out who didn't come back and whose who's friend they were and so on because you got, uh, some people got pretty close uh, acquaintance with some of the ground people and that was sometimes very sad. Uh, although I never was on the ground in Europe, going to the Netherlands and to, uh, and to Belgium and to parts of France. Uh, those people, if they see you were, if they know you were a veteran and they see you're a Canadian, you just can't spend any money. They just won't let you do anything. They're so grateful. The thing that they do in the Netherlands that really impressed us is the people that look after, help look after the, the memorials and the graveyards and so on. Uh, many times they're school teachers and they teach their children to keep talking to your neighbors understanding their wants and needs and make sure they understand yours otherwise we'll have a World War III sort of thing. Make sure you understand what's going on around you. I joined the Naval Reserves in Winnipeg and I belonged to them from 1933 to the start of the war in 1939. But in 1934 I get the bug and I wanted, I start. I learned to fly, and they would be glad to take me because they were short of pilots. But he said, "We well, can't take you to you get your discharge in the Navy." And that's where my book, the, that uh, uh, permission granted that I this wrote, was that's how it started. Uh, I, I got paraded before the captain, and uh, he, he wasn't very pleased because I'd been, uh, what, over six years, and I was a tele leading telegraphist, and uh, he couldn't understand anybody wanting to leave the Navy and, and fly. Anyway, he said okay, and that was permission granted. But I joined the Air Force. I was very, very fortunate in the instructors that I had because when I flew the Atlantic then I became a short snorter. Somebody that was a short snorter, they signed uh, one of my Canadian bills and then that uh, was, was quite a big club. Being in England then, uh, the uh, ferry command that was the Royal, that was the Royal Air Force Ferry Command. They had flights back to Canada, and I was lucky to I got on a flight back to Canada, Liberator, and actually the uh, captain was flown by an old uh, uh, Trans Canada Airlines pilot, a lad named Lindy Rood. There was uh, and it wasn't nice and with Chesterfields and everything. We climbed into the Liberator and had everything on we owned, and they had mattresses laying on the Bombay doors, and uh, we took off and we were up to twenty some odd thousand feet, and uh, it was cold because it was the middle of winter then, and uh, we went from there to uh, Goose Bay and then from there to Montreal, so. Uh, and I would have been about 17. And uh, we moved from New Toronto, 1313 Street in New Toronto. Uh, we owned two houses there, 13 and 15. And uh, I don't know why my parents decided to go to Oakville, but I guess they wanted to go into business. 
you know, to start business, although it was a depression, there was no money around at that time. When you come of certain age, you had to go and serve, I think, three or six months in the Army when we escorted all these uh, tankers from the UK to the Dutch West Indies, Willemstadt, Curacao. Uh, we were 30, 31 days at sea. We left uh, London there and picked up the convoy, went down through the Irish Sea, Bristol Channel, St. George's Channel, and down off the coast of France, past Gibraltar, and we had uh, the 42nd Escort Group. We had four American DEs, destroyer escorts, and a Polish destroyer. And the Polish destroyer got contact with a submarine, they sank it, and it was an Italian submarine. They'd recovered uh, one of the crew's lungs and an Italian coffee can. They had to have proof that they sunk a ship, you know, or they couldn't claim. But that was the first trouble we ran into. And we were all right until we started to go across the Atlantic when the aircraft, we had aircraft carry, uh, coverage so far out in the Atlantic. And when they couldn't come out any farther, then we started. Every night after dark, we were attacked by submarines. And our ship had to go to the stern of the convoy because we had the Captain D on it. He was in charge of the the group. Every night we dropped back and night after night that happened halfway across the Atlantic. And we lost uh, three tankers and uh, one of them got hit just back of the bow, but it kept going. They, they must have had a good crew on board because they must have sealed it off. And that hole in that thing was as big as a house, right back of the bow. And all, most of these ships had uh, nets strung out on divots alongside the ship to stop any, or well, hope to stop any torpedoes from hitting them. No, that's the worst time we had. One. I joined up when I was uh, 18, just turned 18. And uh, my friend and I decided that uh, we were wasting our time in, in high school in fifth form. <laughs> and my father always said we joined the army to graduate. <laughs> and there might be truth in that too, because they did give us a year when we joined the army. Oh yes, we had five years in the, in the cadet corps. And, and in those days, everybody had to serve in the cadet corps unless you were uh, mentally incapacitated or physically incapable of getting around. Uh, those were the rules by the principal of the high school, Mr. Archibald, and uh, he felt very strongly that everybody should serve in the Cadet Corps because his son was one of the first casualties in, the, in Oakville in the Air Force. And we spent the winter of 44, 45 at Nijmegen, at the Nijmegen Bridge. But I never used my training, although I got 10 cents a day more for it for being a gun liar, I never used my qualifications. They, when I arrived at the regiment, they decided they needed a, a, a another soul in the reconnaissance unit, there was 10 of them, so that's where I went. So, oh, we did all the Joe jobs, actually, we were attached to headquarters, and when the regiment moved, we used to have to go out and go ahead of the regiment and pick the sites for the, the accommodation and what, wherever headquarters was going to be, and then, uh, of course, when we did that, we had very little to do, so they find all kinds of jobs for us to do. We used to do flash spotting, we'd go out with a range finder, and swap the gun, enemy gun flashes and read the, the distance and send that back so they could do counter battery work. And we used to run uh, wires out or uh, telephone wires out to the forward observation posts so they could be in contact by wire as well as radio for the counter battery work. <laughs> that, the, the, an interesting story on the, on the uh, running wire out, I think we were in Moyland 
which was around the Hochwald Forest in Germany, and it was miserable in February and March. And uh, we were running a tool to run a wire out to the forward observation post, and uh, my chum and I, we drew the lot to wire it. We were running this wire out, and we came to the dugout where uh, George Blackburn, the, the author of the book, uh, the, Guns of, the Guns of Victory, uh, must be in the library, and uh, we ran the wire out for his telephone, and of course it was dead when we got there, but in any event, we went inside the dugout, and as soon as they opened the flap and you saw the light, uh, a chap said to me, Harry Barrett, what the hell are you doing here? And it was Ralph Young, who was the second in command of uh, the uh, Royal Regiment from Toronto, and uh, it was a major, and Ralph knew me as a kid. He just lives across the street from, from Erklis, and of course he's dead now, and his wife and knew them well. He knew me and the family, and what a strange place to be. He says, what the hell are you doing here? And I said, the same as you, Ralph, trying to stay alive. <laughs> and Major Blackburn didn't think much of, well, Captain Blackburn in those days, he didn't think much of me talking to the Major that way. <laughs> but it was, what a, what a coincidence it was. But that was another funny story. When we ran the wire up, it was oh, at night, and it was muddy and cold, and we were getting shelled, and uh, the wire was dead. So we had to trace the wire all back at night to find the break, and we found a couple. And we didn't find breaks, we found the wire was tied together, not spliced, because we had to pick our own wire. And it turned out the chum of mine was quite a joker. We were supposed to splice the wire together, but he just tied a knot in it. So we had spent the rest of the night feeling this wire along on our hands and knees to find, and oh, I cursed him for that. <laughs> You know, you never see them after the war, but when you were there for such a short time with them, you lived, you slept together, well, uh, and the whole bit, you did everything together. We, the ten of us, we drew our own rations. We didn't have a cookhouse or anything like that. We drew our own rations, did our own cooking. And we cut our own hair, everything. We did everything together.